Dog Todd is God. All right, so it's Ask or Tell Me Anything. You're going to be calling, if you are calling, if you choose to call, you shall call 888-720-9677, as several people already have, 888-720-WNPR. You can talk about uh, whatever you want to talk about. We are very excited to have a caller, uh, our first caller of the day, from Cranston, Rhode Island, the birthplace of Buddy CNC, although perhaps not that's not what Cranston Wants to be known for anymore. <laughs> I don't. I don't mean to say that it is. Hi, Sandy. Hi there, Colin. Um, I have recently retired, and it gives me more time to catch your show, which I am grateful for. And I was especially grateful um, about a couple of shows last week after the assassination attempt against Trump, where um, I was reading lots of things from people saying, oh, it's a false flag. And you sort of tried to pull people back from the brink of conspiracy theories. That was really important to me. And then um, the day after the GOP convention, when you had the show about hope and you, um, you brought on some people that uh, sort of reminded me that even sometimes if we can't see how things are going to get better, that they, might get better. Maybe we can make them be better. So um, a lot of why I'm calling is simply to appreciate and thank you for the shows. And then I also just wanted to talk about um, the fact that um, well, you've, you've talked about dystopian um, literature and dystopian uh, movies and TV shows. And when I was, um, you know, in my teens and 20s, I feel like I was reading some utopian stuff, and it seems like there's been a huge shift, and I think those utopian views were really important. I agree. I mean, look, they're both important, and we shouldn't yeah. minimize the importance of, for example, Margaret Atwood's work on The Handmaid's Tale, and actually The Mad Adam cycle is also really great, but The Handmaid's Tale is a really important document, not only as fiction, not only as speculative fiction, but it's so the, the the ideas in it are so recognizable in terms of just today. Uh, and, and so a visionary like Atwood has really helped us understand what kind of situation we might be in. And that's important, but I agree that, you know, there, there ought to be, and there is some, I'm not suggesting that there isn't some, and, and maybe it's also what gets to the market and what gets celebrated and watched. And maybe our appetite, appetite for dystopia is greater than our appetite for other things. But but I, I found myself craving a, a different kind of culture. And what I've done, actually, this is sort of not, a non-analogous choice, but I've gravitated a lot towards detective fiction because I like detective fiction because ultimately there is somebody trying to fix a problem. You know, you feel as though you feel as though there's somebody who is determined to place order ahead of chaos to ha and to to elevate good and punish evil. And that there's I like sometimes I'm driving around at night and I'll be listening to an audio book of a detective novel. And it makes me feel good. It's like there's somebody who's out there trying to fix this thing. Uh, and that might be the substitute we have right now, but it would also be nice to see something that was a little bit more optimistically imagined. I don't know, Sandy, maybe that just sort of seems naive to people now, but it shouldn't be. Mm. I, so uh, can, am I still on the air? You're here? still, you're still on the air, but you yeah, don't have to be. Well, I just wanted to mention a couple of, um, and it, it often was sci-fi mm. um, books that um, I appreciated. One was the the book called Ecotopia, um, and another was uh, March Piercy's A Woman on the Edge of Time. Oh yeah, and both of those were um, really good at helping helping frame things in a in a more optimistic light, although they didn't, neither one shied away from from the things that weren't going well. So. You know, I think also, our, our, I have to go into other callers here, but this is a really interesting yeah. topic. But I think our dystopias are more dystopian, too. If you even look at certain sort of franchise yeah. dystopias, like the that second Mad Max movie, The Road Warrior, it really was about moral agency. It really was about, you know, this... First of all, a group of people trying to live a relatively moral life, besieged constantly by these horrible hordes of weirdos, 
Um, and then you have this guy enter into it who's sort of a Gary Cooper kind of figure, except that it's Mel Gibson, uh, and he doesn't seem like he initially cares about anybody, and then he agrees uh, to help them. And I, I think the franchise has gotten more and more interested in the bad people, <laughs> less and less interested in any good people. Uh, and so, yeah, our dy even our dystopias are more dystopian. But thank you very much for your call, and thank you very much for your really kind words, Sandy. I do want to say this, as long as she opened the door. I, I was just saying this in an email to Bill Useman, who's on the show a lot. I don't really, our show, I think <laughs> the rest of the staff would confirm this. We're not like a victory lap culture on this show. I mean, like we do a show, we think it's pretty good, but we can also usually see something we should, we could have done better or I don't know. We're just not the party popper people. But I will say that what we did last week and what we did yesterday, um, what we did Back to back Friday's show and then Monday's show, we are we did a type of show that I think almost any other public radio show at any other station in America would be hard pressed to equal. Um, and I know that sounds kind of like hubris, and I really wouldn't say it under ordinary circumstances. But what this and it's not me; it's like a whole group of people, uh, a whole group of people decided heading into Friday and then heading into Monday, that we were going to try to do shows that somehow or other weren't simply regurgitations of what everybody else was doing, but were about the same subject matter looked at, you know, in, ideally in a more finely grained and complex and innovative way. And that's us at our best. We don't do a show that good every day. But in fact, I'm really tired from doing those shows and, and, and the Wednesday show we did last week. I, I got really tired out. I can't sustain this personally. But um, it, but it's uh, anyway, I'm glad that Sandy and other people noticed because I'm, I'm proud of the work that we did. Uh, and I promise not to say things like that again. Uh, OK, uh, let's go to Kari. Uh, we've also got Chip and Christine. We're just excited about all of this. So um, here we go with, well, let me get her. Hi, Kari uh, from Hamden. You're on the air. Hi. I also want to uh, congratulate you for the last two shows. They were amazing and just what we needed. Um, I'm, I want to talk about doing the right thing and about the elections. I am so relieved that President Biden has dropped out of the race, and I hope this means he'll be focusing on governing like hosting a summit of big deals who could lower some prices of grocery basics. Well, yeah, so and, for me, and the most let's just stay with that for a second, Kari, then I want you to complete your thought. But, you know, I think this is one of the undercovered and very interesting questions. Here's a guy who's now turned, been t turned loose from whatever constraints he felt electoral politics might be imposing on him. Parenthetically, of course, the Supreme Court has given him a license to kill as well. And we hope he won't <laughs> he won't do that. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's got an awful lot of latitude. Uh, but on a more serious note, uh, yeah, I mean, he's not totally free of electoral politics because what he does will you know, be umbilically attached to Kamala Harris. But he, right. he has the opportunity to make some choices you know, more oriented towards what he thinks is the right thing, what his values are, uh, and, right. and to be less worried about the political fallout. Anyway, continue your thought. Yeah. So for me, the most important thing for him, for him to address is the crisis in Gaza and the rest of Israel-Palestine. I have seen with my own eyes what it's like to live under military occupation in the West Bank. Every day to have a knee on your neck, your movements limited and monitored, the threat of being imprisoned without charge always looming. And I know Israelis are suffering, too, under the rule of Netanyahu. And we have to do something to turn the tide. And here's the part about elections. I think the Democrats can't lose sight of the fact that college and grad students will be returning to campuses soon. And protesters are already organizing. Democrats need to be ready for this, to do better than last time, to speak to passionate young people and to give hope to traumatize people in Israel and Palestine. I know it's incredibly complex, but it starts with separating the well-being of the entire region from the well-being of the Likud government and their deadly policies. Yeah, I, 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 let me see, also say this, and I don't want to paint, you know, an overly sunny picture, but 
one thing that Kamala Harris has done, kind of almost a little bit. Remember when Biden was vice president and he kind of got to gay marriage ahead of Obama? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes vice presidents do that. And I think if you go back and look at what she said about this stuff in her position as vice president, in terms of calling for ceasefires and stuff like that, I think she's been a little bit ahead of Biden, so to speak. I noticed uh, that, too. Yeah. So, you know, which is now she's walking a tightrope. Now there's a balancing act. I think also, now I'm about to sort of construct a speculative scenario, but one thing that we were hearing going into the weekend, and one weekend, one reason I was relatively unprepared for what happened on Sunday, was that Biden wanted to be um, f- a fully vested president when Netanyahu uh, came to America. He didn't want to be a guy who had agreed mm. not to run, that he wanted to meet Netanyahu kind of at full strength. And I, I think maybe a couple of things may have changed his mind, one of them being maybe he wasn't getting over COVID fast enough so that it was going to matter. Um, right. But um, that would have been interesting to see what Biden would have said, how he would have handled that visit or whatever encounter. I know it wasn't really scheduled exactly as a visit with him, but um, but yeah, I think this is a thing worth watching. And I think that you're right. The youth vote has been mobilized now on behalf of Kamala Harris in a way that nobody's seen since 2008. Um, there, you know, you look what's going on in social media and stuff and just these young people mm-hmm. who were, who were pretty numb, understandably numb about this election right. are suddenly very, very excited. Uh, now that excitement may dissipate somewhat if they don't see a moral articulation of the position that you just described. It doesn't have to necessarily involve throwing Israel to the wolves or anything like that. But uh, right. I, I think young people do need to hear something a little bit more, um, more meaningful to them, uh, if they if if they if in fact the Democratic Party wants to to keep them excited. But so, Kari, thank you so much for your call. This is a, a very interesting thing to talk about. So, hope thank you call you. again. Okay. Um, so let's do, we've got, okay. Um, <laughs> they're, they're all interesting, aren't they? We'll go to Chip first and then, uh, Christine either next or right after the next break. Uh, so we have Chip is joining us from East Haven or Staven, I, as I believe it is sometimes called. <laughs> yeah, Staven, you're right. Hi, Colin. First time, long time. Love the show. Um, I was wondering what your take or, or if you could tell me, because I don't know the answer. There's a lot of noise online. Um, about democracy being stolen because of the way in which the Democratic Party is now uh, going to be choosing the their appointee for president. Um, but really, since we're not, since we don't have a popular vote anyway, is it really any different? Because the delegates are really the ones in the end who choose um, the winner anyway. Yeah, I mean, I I see. I see what is being said. Um, first of all, we have to back up. And from, from 5,000 feet, it's worth noting, primaries are, are, are a good but relatively new uh, um, concept in American electoral politics. Uh, and, and they are for the good. However, in a situation like this, where the person is one, who has collected all those votes and therefore all those delegates isn't running anymore, um, and isn't running anymore for reasons that appear to be connected to his health. Uh, I, I just think common sense says, all right, well, there's no real way to preserve that scenario, and there's not enough time to, to conduct national primaries or to reconduct national primaries. And, you know, every convention has its own rules. They set their own rules at the beginning. They can make their decisions about what the rules are. Um, and typically what happens at conventions anyway, if in fact, um, a candidate arrives at a convention with, um, with not all of the delegates sewed up through primaries, which is obviously more true in a, in a more fluid non-incumbent scenario. And I'll just give you an example. Um, I mentioned this before, I think maybe last week or something, but in 2000, in 2000, uh, I was in Philadelphia for the Republican convention. So that was, you know, an open field, um, you know, Bush, uh, and and McCain wound up being the two people sort of, you know, vying. But Bush really started to pile up wins. And so when we got to Philadelphia, the plan was what the convention wanted 
was a voice vote, just a unanimous by acclaim voice vote for Bush. The only way you could do that would be if all the McCain delegates folded. McCain announced that he was releasing his delegates. And I think there were two main pockets, and Connecticut was one of them. Connecticut was a real McCain state, Chris Healy, Ben Deval, people like that. And they were very serious about McCain. And their reaction, and I don't think they were, I, I'm sure Chris, Ben's no longer with us, but I'm sure Chris would maybe dispute this now, but the truth is they weren't that impressed with W. They just weren't, you know, and they really loved McCain. And they, they just said, we're not doing it. We don't care. You know, we don't care what, it, what anybody says to us. We're not doing it. We're, we want to roll call and we're going to vote for McCain. And McCain eventually had to get to them. Uh, I don't think he came in person. I think he did it by a video, like a teleconference or something. I can't remember. But McCain said, you know, you really have to do this. But, I mean, that gives that's maybe an example, Chip, of how fluid this is. It isn't really hammered out in stone the way some people are suggesting right now. Conventions do things. You know, conventions do things other than simply ratify the results of primaries. Uh, and so uh, this isn't, I mean, this is a weird situation, but it's not that aberrant in the way that other people might be suggesting. Does that mean, mean anything? Am I making yeah, any sense? No, that, that, it, it, that, that, that is kind of what I was assuming. And I figured you would back it up. Yeah. Um, Are you making you know, coffee it, right it, now? Cause I would really like some, it sounds like you're doing something in the kitchen there. Okay. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm filling a, a vase with water. To, it's my wife's birthday today, so I'm filling a vase with water to put flowers in. Happy birthday, Chip's making, wife. <laughs> Lillian is her name. Happy birthday, yeah, Lillian. Yeah. Many well, happy returns. Thank you returns. so much. All right. We have, by a, by a unanimous you. acclaim, by voice vote, we were saying happy birthday to Lillian. I think I can squeeze Christine in here, and then we'll take a break. I, I don't think anybody will mind if I do that. Uh, so, Christine from Killingly, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, Christine, are you there? Well, that solves that. She's not there. <laughs> All right. So we'll take a little break. Uh, we're, we've got other people calling in. The numbers are 888-720-9677. That would be 888-720-WNPR. We'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, I could just babble. You rock your hips like a boat in the ocean. Sway your hips like a tree in the breeze. It's like we're mixing love potions Ooh, girl, I never want to leave Cause there's no place I'd rather be Catherine Russell. You know, there's just certain singers who, I mean, she's not doing anything crazy with that Billy Eckstein song. Um, there's some singers who just, even if they're just singing it straight the way it's written on the page, they just do something with it. And it's almost impossible to find words for it. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. Or maybe it is. Um, the number is 888-720-9677. If you're just joining us, we do not have guests today. That's not the way we do things and I, on Ask or Tell Me Anything. We say that you can call 888-720-WNPR and become the guest or the host, or you can just make a, a power grab here and just take over everything. Uh, but it's 888-720-WNPR. We're going to try again with Christine, Christine from Killingly. Hi, Christine. Hi there. How are you? Good. Good. So I... Um wanted to say that I think we should just rip the Band-Aid off and Pete, put Pete Buttigieg in as VP. We have a biracial woman at the top of the ticket. We're going to have a white male for the VP position. Pete Buttigieg has been so effective in his position, and I just wonder what your comments are about that. 
Yeah, I mean, I know what you're saying, and and there's nothing wrong with what you're saying. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, <laughs> and you know, I mean, I I think right now we have there's, there's only only so much paradigm shifting you can do in one cycle. So we've never had yeah. a woman, we've never had a woman president. Uh, we've certainly never had a black woman president. We've never had a desi American president of either gender. So we're really talking about a, a big shift here. Uh, with Kamala Harris. And so throwing gay men into it um, might be kind of overloading the circuits uh, of the electorate a little bit. And I think you're, we're now at the point. I mean, this is a horrible way to think about things. And I want to promise you, it's not the way I think about things, nor is it the way that you think about things. But right now, you have to look at this and think, we don't want to give somebody a reason not to do this. And we don't know how many people are left in America who might be persuadable voters, um, but would have a problem if you added the gay man part to it. I always feel like this is kind of settled. You know, this is not something that is that gets people as excited as it did 20 years ago. But, you know, I live in Connecticut and so do you. Uh, and I think that's maybe an in inaccurate size sample. And I'll tell you also, even in Connecticut, there are these uh, pages on Facebook. Uh, one of them is called Selvington Speaks Freely. And there's another one called, I think, All Things Colchester or something. I can't remember what they're called. But, you know, there you, you go there and you, you see people who are furious that there even is a Pride Month. And, and that Pride Month is about... LGBTQ people and that, you know, pride, they feel as though these people have stolen the idea of pride and the rest of us aren't getting it anymore. And it's just this, this kind of infantile stuff. But I mean, the notion that everybody or even close to everybody has kind of straightened up and started to fly right about this issue. I think it's maybe a little bit of a bubble thing for us, you know? And, and so listen, I'm, I could vote for Pete Buttigieg without hesitation. But the question is, how many people might the ticket lose? And I'm thinking, you know, it's probably going to be one of the sort of straight white guys we've been hearing about. <laughs> You know, it's going to be it's going to be Shapiro. It's going to be Cooper. It's going to be Kelly. Um, I, it'll be somebody like that. But but I hear you, too. You know, like, why not prove that we're there's another way we're we're not, you know, limited. But I don't know. You know what I'm saying? I, I do. And I think this would um, so activate the the young people. Um, I think they are excited that Biden has stepped down. And I think at least with, with my son, for whatever reason, Kamala Harris has a, a credibility problem with him. And I think naming Pete would just bridge that gap. But, yep. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> so we used to say, <laughs> we used to say vice president, presidential picks don't matter. But you know, in recent years, they have. They've been important. They typically don't matter in terms of what they deliver. They can matter in terms of how they hurt you. Now, I'm not suggesting that Pete is in that category. When I say that, I'm thinking more like, you know, somebody like Sarah Palin. Um, right. But um, I, I I think we're in, you know, I think there are other ways. First of all, ultimately, to sort of continue with that point, Kamala Harris has to persuade people as to her credibility. Um, I'm not even sure your son is going to be reassured simply because she picks a VP that, that he's comfortable with. Um, I mean, ultimately, she has to prove that she's credible. And I think she's very capable of doing this. My understanding of her and I kind of did a little bit more about two weeks ago. I started to wonder if this is going to happen. And I really tried to inform myself about her a lot more than I had. because, And I quickly realized, you know, Vice president, it's like the witness protection program. I mean, you just don't see these people very much at all. Um, so, you know, what I came to understand is that she she has become more of a policy wonk. You know, she's actually kind of a details person to a certain degree. Uh, and I'm hoping that she gets that across. She's already got the fun wine aunt thing happening. You know, but but your son is right that she needs to also prove that she can be the other person. And I, I don't think any Veep is going to solve that problem. I think she has to solve the problem. But thanks so much for your call, Christine. Uh, and tell your son not to lose faith. Oh, my Lord. Really? Honestly? Well, I'm not going to Sarah quite yet. <laughs> 
because um, because I don't want to, but also because William has been waiting longer, and that's fair, right? So here's William in Middletown. Hi, Colin. Um, great. It's uh, I, I was telling your producer that um, I filter the news now kind of through, hmm, how is this going to play out on Colin McEnroe's show? Oh, my Lord. Um, if I... If I, if I if I share it with all of Connecticut, you know, um, and that's good. It's a good thing. Um, but um, I was sitting at home uh, on Sunday with my son. We were talking. He got a phone call, and it was his wife. And his wife said, uh, Bob just got out of the race. And my son told me, and it was like a dark cloud lifted from me. And I didn't realize how utterly depressed i was walking around my my son is in the is he's in his uh, early 30s so his political um viewpoints had been getting me down he's very very has been very very critical of um uh the democrats biden um not that he's a supporter of the republicans he's certainly not but um so i've been kind of picking up a little bit on this stuff and um when i heard that that um that things had changed it was like i was lifted up and um i am since then um walking around with a big smile on my face and i'm i'm just much more optimistic about the future so um i i I came, uh, I tuned, tuned in late to the show and I wasn't going to call, but I said, you know what, let me just call and share myself with, uh, Connecticut and with Colin. So anyway, uh, thank you very much. All right. Yes. So you used to walk in the shade with your blues on parade. Um, <laughs> and I, you know, I identify, I would, I would word it differently about myself, but, um, one of the things that had been weighing on me really certainly since January, if not earlier than that is the way that I started to see the election was, okay, so Trump is who he is. He has a certain group of people who will never desert him. Uh, And then there's presumably some other group that are weighing their options. Um, And the way to win the election, the the way that Biden was going to win the election, I think I said this yesterday too, it was more like playing defense. You're playing defense against Trump. You're trying to, you know, you're the goalie. You're trying to make sure his puck doesn't get in there. Uh, and, And the problem with that was that, I felt starting in January that would be a question of how many senior moments happened to Biden and how vivid they were. Uh, and and I started to worry in a way that's similar to what you're talking about. It was like I was worrying more than I was even noticing how much I was worrying. Um, and But I started to worry that's going to happen, that's going to happen. you know. And if he, mm-hmm. if he really All wipes right. out, this is going to be a huge problem. Now, in a way, I see June 27th as a gift. Uh, it came early enough so that all this could happen. Uh, this, if it had mm-hmm. happened in September, we really would have been, uh, I mean, you might as well hand Trump the keys at that point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I had a similar feeling on Sunday. When you do the job that we do here, you can only have those feelings for like about 20 minutes. <laughs> then, we're, then we're all on Slack. I mean, I was very impressed. Everybody just turned up on Slack uh, on Sunday. Uh, and started brainstorming the shows that we'd be doing. So, uh, but I get it. You know, I, I hear you. And I think you also see that. Um, I mean, I'm really struck by what's going on in social media right now. And that might seem like a frivolous consideration. I don't think it is. I think the history of presidential politics is about relatively new media being harnessed by certain people who know how to use it effectively. That was true of the way that FDR used radio. It was the true of the way that JFK and maybe especially Ronald Reagan used television. Um, it was true to a certain degree about Obama. Obama, in a way, was the really the first truly digital president. President and digital president in the way, in the sense also that people who liked him started making their own um, their their own content about him. There was a the so-called Obama girl. I think the Obama girl videos have seen been seen by two hundred seventy million people or something, or two hundred seventy million views anyway. Um, and and I think what's happening on TikTok right now is a whole bunch of kids who I said this earlier were numb about this election. A whole bunch of people, 18 to 30, you know, not that interested, two old guys, you know, not really worth getting excited about. A lot of these people are excited uh, in in a way that they hadn't been before, and that's got to be good. Anyway, thanks for your call, William. I don't want to go too long because, oh, do we really have to do this? Okay, we'll do it. Sarah from Manchester, who 
clearly wants to ruin my day and possibly cost me my FCC license. Not that I actually have one. Sarah, you have the floor. Oh, where'd she go? <laughs> Could this be a bank error in my favor? Uh, I didn't mean to sound that discouraging, Sarah. Anyway, she's not there anymore. Here. Wait, are you there? Oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah, yep, I, yep. I am not ruining your day. Okay. I am doing the perfect segue from the Obama girl to the Trump girl, mm -hmm. which is the hawk to a girl. Mm -hmm. You know, she's an American hero. I watched the documentary on her family, and they are very, very proud of you know, the contribution that she's given to the internet. <laughs> this, th this is a person I will attempt to describe this because I think there's a s substantial number of people who don't even know what we're talking about right now. This is a person who became viral because of her description of her relationship to the reproductive organ of men. Uh, which, I, which I found degrading kind of, I didn't, but you yeah. think <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I was like, I didn't realize so many men felt so low about themselves. But yeah, it's, it's definitely Google. Well, also, I don't know. What is she going to tell her grandchildren? Assuming, you know, there's life on Earth by the time she's a grandmother. No, Colin, like, they're, they're proud of her. Yeah, I know. Like her, her, her me, mom, and papa are, are wearing and my family is like originally from West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm not disparaging like any... But this is a whole cultural thing. This is like, you know, that Zen culture, the, you know, the, the pickup truck. And it's this new form of Americana yep. that's taken a, a next level crazy jump because of the Internet. Yep. No, I think you're right. And probably something that we're going to have to look into uh, in greater depth. So um, so I think we've had a very successful conversation. Um, right, right. Very classy. All right, go go and, and do your thing. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Uh, whatever my thing might be. It's not the hawk to a girl, I can tell you that. Um, all right, so um, I'm so glad we got through that phone call. Okay, let's say, let's see what we're going to do. We'll go to Charlie and then Mary Jane's also on the line here. Let's do Charlie and then we'll go to a break. I think that's probably a good plan. And it's also, we're starting to get some calls that have relatively little to do with the election, which is probably healthy also. Here's Charlie in Glastonbury. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Colin. Thanks for my call. Sure. Um, I, so uh, I was reading this article the other day about people talking to themselves and perhaps why they talk to themselves and how common or uncommon it may be. And uh, I was wondering if you would uh, do a show about that and do your usual research and have all the experts come on and talk about why people talk to themselves. Yeah, we actually did do this show, but it was a really long time ago um, and so long ago that it kind of doesn't count anymore because I don't. And I think... In, if I'm remembering the show correctly, it was as much about people hearing voices um, as it was uh, about, and we had people in the studio who hear voices and are in a kind of constant dialogue with those voices. I'm actually really no, intrigued by this. This is what you're talking about, people talking to themselves. Yeah. Um, yes, this is me talking to me uh, in various ways, uh, sometimes praising myself, sometimes maybe even criticizing myself, perhaps. You know, w w what is the psyche and how does that all work that way? Yeah, and I will say this. First of all, it's a subject, I suppose, one might say dear to my heart. I talk to myself. I think it's a kind of a product of having been an only child. But the older I get, the more I talk to myself. I mean, I feel like I'm getting like Robert Durst-like or something. <laughs> like, you know, that's like the really bad kind of talking to yourself. But, um, but I'm not quite Bobby Durst uh, yet at this point. But I do think that we all do it. I mean, in a way, to me— I mean, I wouldn't be a guest on this show, so I don't know what my opinion is actually worth. But um, to me, it's really kind of a fuller and more audible expression of consciousness. If you think about what consciousness is, I believe consciousness is a conversation we are having with ourselves for our entire lifetime. Um, that's, to me, what consciousness is. It, it, it really is that sort of in, internal dialogue. Um, and, and so it's not surprising that some of us say, say some of that stuff out loud. Although I, the other thing that I do in lieu of talking to myself, because I think it doesn't count, is I talk to my dog Um like I say things to him that he could not possibly understand. Um, but I, I think, well, at least I'm not talking to myself. I'm talking to Declan right now about the common market or something. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for your call. We will probably come back to that show. It's a good topic. Uh, and we, it's the kind of thing that we could do. And obviously I have some uh, pretty severe mental problems uh, that are expressing themselves in this form. That always makes it an appealing topic as far as I'm concerned. All right. So, well, let's do Mary Jane and then we'll go to a break. We're not that screwed for time right now. We can, we can, we can do Mary Jane. Mary Jane in uh, North Stonington. Hi, Mary Jane. Oh, hi, Colin. 
Um, thanks for uh, putting me on the air again. And I have been listening to the Senate testimony of a wonderful whistleblower. Her name is Tracy Rodas, and she has found a lot of the missing children from the uh, HS. But by finding them, they were blaming her, and she lost her job. So maybe if some of the listeners could just listen to her testimony, maybe email our representatives, maybe get her job back, or maybe get another person who could help track down some of these uh, lost children because they are in a great deal of trouble. Yes, absolutely. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for your call. Yeah, uh, there are multiple whistleblowers active uh, in terms of our current immigration activities. Uh, I think it's important. I think there's just a lot that gets lost. You know, it's turned into a strictly political issue. Um, and what gets lost as we argue whether Biden had the right approach or Trump had the right approach or a different approach or there have to be mass deportations, the reality of what's happening there right now, which is not good. I mean, just even in terms of people who desperately need medical care, not being in a holding facility and not getting it. Uh, it's, it's bad and it's, it's, we can do better. Well, we're a better country than that. I hope. Anyway, we'll take a break. We'll come back. The number, by the way, 888-720-9677. Please call it if you would like to talk. 888-720-WNPR. It's ask or tell me anything. And we are back. Thanks to our technical producer today, Eugene Amatruda, the Jedi Master. We are privileged. Uh, and our producer today uh, is the producer of the show, and the call screener is Jonathan McPants. Um, all right, so um, is there anything else I need to say? I guess not. Um, we'll go back to the calls here then. Uh, it's 888-720-9677, 888-720-WNPR. I will say that if you're listening live on Tuesday, which is what day it is. Um, we'll be doing a couple of shows here that uh, coming up that won't have anything to do with the election, which I think is gratifying. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to do a show about the idea of the literary canon. How do we decide what what works are indispensable? Um, and how's that culture war going and stuff like that? And then uh, a show that I ordered up a long time ago, we're doing a show about humming, which is in addition to talking to myself, maybe my other major internally driven activity. Uh, but I think you'll be surprised at some of the things that we will learn together about humming uh, on Thursday. All right. So, and then, I don't know. Well, we don't know. Uh, I won't say more. I cannot say more. Let's go to the phones here. We're going to start with Irene. Uh, Irene from Wallingford. Hi. Hi. I've been a fan since the Bruce and Colin day. Uh, I just wanted to say that. Uh, but my, yeah, my question is, do you think it's possible that the Trump campaign will find or manufacture some constitutional loophole and bring it to the Supreme Court, which would obviously rule in their favor and, you know, invalidate the Democratic Convention? No. I mean... No. Good. I, I, you know, I don't know what value my thoughts about this have. But first of all, Political uh, conventions are not contemplated in the Constitution. <laughs> um, political parties are barely contemplated in the Constitution. And, um, and, and a convention, and even the primary process that precedes it, is essentially a creature of the party. Um, once you get uh, to polls that are, to some degree or other, regulated by, by government, there are, I mean, the polling places and stuff like that. Maybe there's a little bit of a, a way in which um, outside forces kick in. But no, I, I, you know, 
first of all, every convention is is allowed to and does adopt its own rules for that specific convention at the beginning uh, of the convention. Um, the Supreme Court, I mean, I should never say anything about the Supreme Court any more dispositively right. because every completely insane thing that I would have claimed that they would never do, they have been doing lately. And certainly if right. they could think of a way, I'm sure that's the wellspring of your question. If they could Correct. think of a way to, yeah. do, to do this, they would. But I, I don't think... I don't think, want to give them any ideas. Yeah, no, but. they listen all the time to this show, too. It's just like <laughs> Alito's got it on in his office, you know, he's... You know, Thomas listens to the podcast. Um, so uh, I, I don't think that's I mean, you're also going to see um, some actual legal challenges possibly being filed about the war chest. Um, I once again don't see that going anywhere, but there's probably a little bit. So in other words, the Biden Harris, uh, you know, they're they're very, very large fund of contributions um, can I mean, one of the reasons that people thought Harris would be the person to kind of take over is that she's the only person eligible just to take over that money. Uh, right. And the, you probably will see the Republicans try to uh, file some challenges to say, no, 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 she, even she's not eligible. You know, and that, I don't think that has any real traction, but it won't, it won't be dismissed, you know, in the first 10 seconds. Somebody will want to think about that. So uh, I think that's the more likely battleground. Um, okay, well, you've eased my mind, and I appreciate that. All right, yes, I wouldn't worry about that. I would go worry about your geraniums. They don't all look right. they don't look so good right now. So uh, yeah, maybe do a little something. Um, okay, um, let's go to James uh, in Manchester. We get we got a bunch of calls here. I will get to as many of you as I possibly can. Hi, James. You have the floor as soon as I do this. Hi, James. Hello. Hi. Hi. So I just wanted to highlight one of the reasons I think that everyone is so jazzed about Kamala Harris, and that is because he's actually giving the Democratic Party something to vote for rather than vote against. We actually saw something similar in France mm -hmm. uh, when Le Pen's party was coming into power. People were worried about that because obviously fascism is bad, but they were still getting votes and they couldn't figure out why. And the answer was they were promising people something. In the U.S., we have sort of a similar problem. The Republicans are promising to t build a giant orphan crushing machine, and the Democrats are promising to not do that. Mm -hmm. And people are th saying to themselves, well, things are kind of not great for me right now, and the Democrats' plan is to do nothing. So even though it sounds bad, maybe I'll cross the aisle and see what they're offering. Maybe it's actually good for me. But in case what we have right now is Harris is giving us, well, I can stop this bad thing. We can stop Project 2025. Uh, I have plans on uh, reproductive health care. We're going to get that back. And people are saying to themselves, finally, I'm not just voting against Trump. There's a concrete game plan. And I wanted to see what you thought about that. No, I think, I think it's essentially true. I mean, we should understand this is not going to be a straight line. Uh, and Harris is going to have some bumps uh, as she heads towards November. Uh, she'll have good days and bad days. Uh, there are going to be some days where her message doesn't work as well or she makes a mistake or whatever. But I do think that people feel a little bit more now like they're not simply tr playing goalie, as I said. They're not just trying to keep Trump out. They really have somebody they, they might want to get in. Um, I, I do think that it's incumbent on Harris. I think she's uh, going to be really good on the reproductive stuff and just women in general. Um, and I think she's going to be very appealing and exciting to women. Um, I think the other thing that she's got to do, and she has some background in this, uh, but I, I think, you know, Bill Curry talked about this yesterday on the show, that portion of the middle class that feels abandoned by the economy is, feels as though they're working more and getting less, uh, that no particular powerful interest has taken in any concern for them. Um, they see Trump, who, you know, at least kind of gives lip service to this idea. I don't really think it's you can really look at Trump's policies or what he did in his four years in office and, and find a, a lot of you know, prizes in that cracker jack box. But, um, that, you know, I, I think she's got to articulate something about that. She's got to say something to people who do feel somewhat left behind, uh, and who feel as though there's no party that cares about them anymore. They absolutely used to be a bedrock part of the democratic party's constituency. And I, I think, 
you know, over the decades, the Democrats have lost touch with those people. They were ripe for the plucking. The two people who got them really excited, 2015, 2016, were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Uh, and each one of them said, I care more about you than I do about powerful interests. You know, one of them meant it. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, she, she somehow or other has to get a message like that across. But, yeah, I totally agree with everything else you're saying. Oh, okay, let's do another Mayor Pete, and that would be Suzanne in Brantford. Um, hello, Suzanne. How are you? Oh, wait a minute. I have to find out how you are by doing that. Hi, Suzanne. Hi. How are you? I'm just fine. <laughs> so I have a question for you. I'm hmm. not sure how I feel about this, but I just want your thoughts. So I'm going to give you a little bit of pushback on the conversation you had earlier about mm -hmm. Pete Buttigieg being vice president. Yeah. So to me right now, Kamala is sort of um, on a rocket ship, at least to the nomination. Mm -hmm. um, who knows if that will continue to the election. Um, but having said that, wouldn't this be the time to maybe think about other people that could do a really good job in spite of their personal life or personal choices? Yeah, I mean, it would be in an ideal world. But first of all, let's just say that rocket ship, you know, is is like, you know, traveling away from Earth at about a 27 degree angle. You know, I, in other words, <laughs> she's she's not uh, I, the polling. We, we don't have any polling that would be useful yet uh, mm -hmm. we'll, in, in about. Four or five days, we can maybe have some polling that will give us a first blush indication. And then, to continue the rocket ship metaphor a little bit, then you want to look at the trend line. You know, we'll have trend lines for a few weeks, uh, maybe before this decision has to be made. But I doubt we're going to see, I mean, best case scenario, uh, she goes up four points three points, something like that over mm. Trump. Um, you look at the swing states, maybe it's a more complicated picture. Um, and then, you know, presumably, I don't think they're going to make this choice just with their guts. They're going to be, they're going to do some, uh, some internal polling on it. They're going to test out some ideas. They're going to look at how various choices play in Michigan or Wisconsin or any of the states that they're worried about. Um, and, you know, I, 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 if Pete makes some sense, I'm sure they'll test his name and his identity and his idea and his ideas. And, you know, if, if they got the right feedback, they would do it. But just heuristically, just kind of ballparking it, uh, it looks to me. And look, I, I, I don't want to be the person saying this. Right. I mean, I, right. I was on a very conservative radio station in the 1990s, and I started talking about gay marriage and how I didn't understand why there was any opposition to it at all. And people treated me like I was insane. Uh, and then mm -hmm. th think how fast, you know, think how fast that changed. It went from being this completely insane, I can't believe you're even talking about this idea, to something we're just completely used to. And, you know, we're just basically— And you're better at— at, like I can't imagine why that's an issue. Yeah, and you're better at looking at the bigger picture. Where I'm kind of stuck in, why is that an issue? If he's right. the best person. Yeah, I, <laughs> I think our politics is the art of the possible. Um, I'm going to have to, mm -hmm. by the way, say goodbye to you right now. But it is the art of the possible. You have to figure out what's possible. Um, you 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 have to fix the problems you have and try not to cause new problems. And sometimes you have to be a little bit unsentimental about that. And I think in a highly polarized environment like this one, you have to be very unsentimental. Uh, but I want to thank you know, Suzanne and everybody else who called today, all great callers. My apologies to Matthew and to Mark. We ran out of time. We'll do this again very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you.